Today, I'm joined by Gervais Williams, Fund Manager of the Diverse Income Investment Trust. The Investment Trust invests across large, mid and small cap companies, including those listed on the AIM market. Heading into 2022, what would you say is the main risk to markets? The thing I'm sort of worried about is I think Chinese growth will be more moderate. I, I think uh, it's been a keystone, uh, cornerstone really, of the global growth over the last uh, 25 years. Uh, and if Chinese growth is more moderate, then I think global growth will be uh, more, more, more sort of difficult. But most particularly, I think the bigger feature is probably going to be wage growth. Uh, I think there's a, a change in behaviour. You know, in the past we've been very happy to get our PPE and other things from long distance suppliers, but during the COVID we found that actually it wasn't just the long distances which are a problem but we're in a queue uh, and so going forward uh, a, lot, a lot of companies are now using local manufacturers rather than long distance manufacturers that's involving uh, extra labor and so we've got a, a, a sort of sur a surplus of demand for labor I think labor costs will be rising relative to turnover for many companies going forward I think there will be a margin pressure as well so I think going into 2022 I think we're looking really at a period when we might find that actually turnover growth isn't particularly strong global growth won't be particularly strong but most particularly many companies are under margin pressure and we've got to select companies which are actually can offset that margin pressure not just hold on to margins but actually thrive at a time when others are suffering and how much of a concern is rising levels of inflation and have you been um, making any changes in the portfolio to protect and potentially profit from rising levels of inflation? Yes, inflation is a difficult feature and clearly that does affect uh, wages. But most particularly, if anything, we think the pressures on, on, on inflation are peaking at this stage. We think, as I mentioned earlier, the Chinese growth will slow and that will mean that global growth will be uh, more, 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 more depressed. The, the, the new variant, the COVID variant, will um, potentially lead to a slowing activity. And if anything, we're also seeing oil prices and metal prices peaking out as well. So if anything, we expect uh, inflationary pressures to be much more moderate next year and we're less worried about that what we are more concerned about is if we do get uh, ongoing wage inflation uh, going forward then there may be companies which are highly borrowed perhaps private businesses which start becoming um, insolvent uh, and that may lead to uh, companies not just going bust but also uh, you know global growth being more uh, more difficult and most particularly it could lead to uh, the government becoming very unsettled because unemployment may start to go up and if that does happen then you could actually get uh, extra financial stimulus at a time when the economy is already fully stretched and that might lead to long-term inflation. That's what happened back in the 70s. In 74 we had temporary inflation. Uh, in 77 when we had lots of unemployment and companies going bust we then injected uh, extra financial stimulus and actually injected permanent inflation or inflation for a generation. I fear that may happen. It hasn't happened as yet. Is pricing power a more important factor for you given given where we are with inflation at the moment I think the key issue isn't just pricing power, but the ability of companies to hold on to margin. And I think that's heavily related to customer service. Uh, we looked at, at our companies and we asked them very closely, not so much how strong their business is, but how well the business is aligned uh, to looking after customers. We meet quite a lot of boards who are quite distant from the day-to-day -day operations of their businesses. They make what they consider to be marvellous decisions for the business, but actually the people at the front line find it harder and harder to deliver customers. So we ask an awful lot actually about how how companies look after their frontline staff, how close they are to making it easy for them to deliver. That's very motivating and engaging. It tends to lead to quite a lot of staff being uh, retained by the business and employed by the business. But most particularly, if you deliver outstanding, not good, but outstanding levels of service, uh, even when your customers come and say, we can buy it cheaper around the corner, you can say, well, you can do, but we deliver outstanding service and it gives you something to defend. So it's a key differential in the way that we select companies with, compared with many other fund managers. In 2021, um, various UK dividends that paused their dividends during the COVID-19 pandemic reinstated those dividends. So what's your outlook for UK dividends in 2022? I think there will be some companies which continue to grow the dividends. Um, uh, we've got quite a few where we're quite excited about the prospects for good and growing income. But I think there will be more unsettled uh, uh, features elsewhere. For example, many of the dividend recovery, much of the dividend recovery we've seen this year has been driven by perhaps a lot of the uh, mining and metals companies. Uh, uh, as I mentioned already, the, the metal prices in many cases have already peaked out and they tend to pay dividends depending on how much profit they make. So if we do find perhaps some of the mining companies have less profit next year, then that will mean that dividends from some of that, these sectors, which are quite important to the London Stock Exchange, uh, could, could fall back. So I think it's going to be 
a, a period when some do grow the dividends, but I think there will be some others which uh, pay less dividends because they make less profit. And I think therefore dividends and dividend growth is going to be quite difficult. Uh, we're hopeful that we've got many companies which are able to grow even when the world's not growing. Uh, so hopefully we can offset that factor, but I think it's going to be a challenge. Could you name a couple of examples of companies that you think will continue growing their dividends when, as you just said, while the world has stopped growing? Yeah, I mean, I think key, the key issue is we look for companies which are able to generate uh, very substantial cash surplus. So uh, one of the largest holdings in the portfolio is, is K3 Capital. K3 Capital is a company which is involved in helping very small businesses uh, with corporate finance. So if you've uh, got a business you're going to sell, it may be valued at 10 million. You don't go to the leading corporate finance houses in London. So they do it for a fixed price. They've got a, law, a legal agreement with a, a lawyer who does it for a fixed price. They push these, these businesses through uh, a relatively low cost operation. Uh, and that uh, uh, is successful. It's been a business which has been taking market share. It's already a UK market leader. It's extended its range of services in the last 12 months through uh, a number of transformational acquisitions, which it bought at very low levels. Uh, and it's already uh, generating not just surplus cash, but, but growing surplus cash. And it's already uh, suggesting that its dividend will grow considerably next year, uh, even uh, it's, you know, ahead, ahead, ahead of the next year actually starting. So, so these kinds of companies are, are outstanding when it, when it comes to actually finding uh, opportunities. Uh, a second Second example of that is uh, Randall and Quilter. Randall and Quilter is a company which is involved in insurance services. Uh, it spent several years bringing uh, new customers through its uh, its 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 network of uh, uh, permissions to deal uh, uh, to sell insurance, perhaps in the U.S. or indeed in Europe. Uh, each individual U.S. state has its own insurance regulations. They all have their own conditions. It's quite difficult to get those permissions. It's got many of these customers already in place. Uh, the dividends uh, are, are, are the company's profits are likely to rise considerably over the next three years and we think that will be reflected in a very substantial growth in dividends as well. And are there any sectors or themes that you have the most conviction in at the start of 2022? The portfolio is very widely diversified. It's in terms of sectors, in terms of individual holdings. As I mentioned, there's just under 140 holdings in the portfolio. So each individual holding makes a relatively small difference and so if we get them wrong of course that's that that's, that's less of a problem but it does mean that actually we've got a great range of opportunities of poten potential winners to be honest we're not looking to pick one sector over another in many cases uh, we're looking for companies where their market position uh, their opportunity, their delivery of service, uh, their investment and the cash pay return on that investment is delivering that, that that attractive cash surplus which drives dividend growth. So it's not down to one or two sectors. I would say that we're probably just generally a bit cautious of world growth, so we're not uh, holding many cyclical holdings. Uh, we've got very few uh, consumer businesses at the moment. That's not to say there isn't going to be a consumer recovery, but what we're really saying is actually even as that recovery comes through, it could be that you start to find that actually uh, they need to repay some of their C bills, their loan they took on during the uh, pandemic, they may find that actually suddenly they've got to pay more VAT. It was it has been only 5%. It's moving up to 20% next year. So we don't think a lot of that cash generation will come through in dividends. So there are some areas where we think some companies are going to struggle a bit, uh, where we've got low weightings. But generally, we've got a good range of individual companies across a wide range of sectors, which we think in their individual circumstances are quite well placed to, to, to grow even at a time when global growth is, is more moderate finding uh, value opportunities are there any um, companies or sectors of the market that have been holding back on paying dividends in 2021 that may surprise on the upside in 2022 i think some of the financials maybe have been a bit cautious we've seen the banks particularly uh, which have reset their dividends at a lower level so that's a good example of an area where we have seen dividends perhaps being more moderate which could recover next year i think the financial sector tends to be one which is actually quite complex there's quite a range of different financials uh, quite a few companies haven't succeeded and there is some scar tissue which tends to mean that some fund managers are a bit cautious of the sector and generally uh, as a sector it's probably one which is uh, uh, not well represented uh, in, in in a lot of uh, uh, sort of international portfolios portfolios because there have been many others areas of recovery where perhaps the financial sectors haven't done as well. So generally this is an area where we think actually it could be pretty exciting. Um, we've got the largest weighting of the portfolio in the financial sector uh, and so if anything we think that's probably an area where we expect the best opportunities. And could you name a couple of examples of companies in that sector? 
Well, perhaps a good example of that might be Just Group. Just Group is a business which does impaired annuities. What are those? Well, if you happen to have diabetes and you buy an annuity, uh, because your life expectancy is slightly less than it would be for someone who didn't have diabetes, you would get an extra uh, you know, income relative to, to, to those which don't have diabetes. And so they do this impaired annuities. It's a brilliant business because actually it looks after its customers really well. Uh, it's got a very strong market position. Uh, but most particularly, uh, it's been really struggling as bond yields keep going down, down, down. It's actually meant that they've had to put a lot of their cash into their uh, solvency to keep their balance sheet safe. Uh, as we find that bond yields start to stabilize and start to increase. Uh, this is a company, for example, which is not just well positioned to generate surplus cash, but actually is standing on what we consider to be a very overlooked valuation, i.e. about half of tangible asset value and a P ratio of, uh, of only five times. So you know, if it starts to generate cash, as it starts to generate cash, you can start to see things like that starting to produce very good dividend growth. Another example is probably Man Group. It's a fund management group. Uh, it's probably known for its hedge funds, but it's actually quite well uh, uh, you know, exposed to, to a range of active strategies. It's very good at adding value not so much just participating market rises, but adding value through stock selection. Uh, it's, it's been recently appointed uh, to a very large uh, new scheme, which will lead to its uh, turnover growing very substantially. And that too, we expect also to have very good dividend growth in the next uh, two years. And do you own any of the five big UK banks that are listed in the FTSE 100? We, we have uh, small holdings. We've got a, a small part in, 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 in uh, uh, NatWest. Uh, we've got a small part in, in Lloyd's. Uh, th these are half holdings, to be fair. We've only got one position uh, between them. Uh, it's, it's probably because we're monitoring them. Uh, as I mentioned, there's scope for some of the banks to actually grow the dividends considerably. But at the moment, they're also finding margin pressures there because actually uh, the net interest margin has been under pressure. So we're waiting for some of the green lights to come on before putting those into full holdings. And finally, a question that we ask all fund managers that we interview, do you have skin in the game? Absolutely. Um, my investment, my personal investment is really down to uh, uh, holdings in my own funds. Uh, that means that when things don't go right, I know why, <laughs> why we've disappointed. But most particularly, obviously, I have uh, some hope that we will deliver some attractive returns. And it's obviously pleasing to participate in that. And we also have, uh, I also individually have a holding in our management company, which is also quoted. Uh, but aside from that, really, I'm not interested in investing in anything else other than obviously things like a home. But apart from that, uh, that all my capital is held in, in my own funds. And, and the PLC, which uh, runs them. Gervais, thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Carl.